me ask you all something. Do you think it's possible to defy death? Now, I'm not talking slowing down the aging process with, like, weird diets or blood transfusions. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the much more plausible approach of sailing to the ends of the earth, marching down into the underworld, meeting the Lord of the Dead in his own house, looking him right in the eye, and saying, hey, knock it off. Well, tonight's story is of a man who tried just that, and the fate that befell him. His name was Orpheus. This hell-adjacent tale is brought to you by Nebula, where you can watch this and all of our other episodes early and without ads like this one for Nebula, where you can watch this and all of our other episodes early and without ads like this one for Nebula, where you can watch this and all of the- wait, hold on, am I in Hades? In the dreamlike, undated prehistory that is the world of Greek mythology, Orpheus lived as a world-class poet and bard. He was taught how to play the lyre by the god Apollo, and his musical prowess could move not just the hearts of man and beast, but the very trees and rocks themselves. Orpheus's music truly moved the world. But what moved him? Well, that would be Eurydice, a beautiful nymph he often saw frolicking with her sisters in the wild mountain vales. They eventually fell in love and were engaged to be wed, which made Orpheus just gloriously happy. But then, on their wedding day, Eurydice, dancing by the river as she was one to do, accidentally stepped on a snake which bit her, its poison traveling straight to her heart, killing her instantly. On her wedding day, isn't that ironic? Now, Orpheus was obviously distraught. He mourned his wife so much and for so long that the world had no more room for his grief. That is, the world above. See, he had an idea. Maybe Eurydice was dead, but why did that really have to change anything? Why couldn't he just, you know, go get her? Ah, don't look at me like that. It was possible. Because going down into the underworld as a mortal being at the time, that was something you could just kinda do. Like, the underworld wasn't a metaphysical concept, but a real place. I mean, Theseus, Heracles, Odysseus, all those guys, heroes, had been there and returned. Of course, this trip beyond the grave was no walk in the park. For in the underworld, the dreadlord Hades presided over the shades of every former mortal. See, when the brothers Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades drew lots for command of the cosmos, Hades got the underworld. Sure, not as picturesque a domain as the sea or the sky, but it was the largest realm in the universe, and it kinda had to be. Because whether you were heroic or wicked in life, everyone dies. And in death, all were bound to Hades' kingdom, and nobody ever ever returned. But come on, rules are made for regular people, you know? Orpheus's plan was to march right up to Hades and say, hey there, I'd like my wife back, please. And then of course Hades would absolutely just be like, ho, ho, no problem, bro, high five. Now, it helps to remember that Orpheus was the most famous musician in the world. Today, we'd say he had sort of, you know, celebrity brain. AKA, he's the guy who's used to getting everything he wants, so why in the House of Hades would this request be any different? And oddly enough, he wasn't all wrong. It was easy for Orpheus to walk straight into the underworld, to bypass the horrifying boatman Charon who ferried souls across the infernal Styx, to sidestep the yapping three-headed guard dog Cerebus, to enthrall the frenzied furies that screeched through the dank air, all because he had the confidence of a legit rock star. He just waltzed on in, strumming his lute, and was that damn good that everyone just let him through all the way to Hades. But you know, that very swagger would turn out to be his Achilles heel. When Orpheus arrived at Hades' hellish place of business, he made his musical pitch to the lord of the underworld and his wife Persephone. You know, he said, I think it'll help if I show you how much I love my wife, which is something that can only truly be expressed through song. He began to play. And y'all, it was the greatest performance by the world's greatest musician. It brought warmth and color to the gloomiest of lands. Even the denizens of the underworld, for whom Hades had prescribed eternal torments, from Sisyphus and his rock to Ixion on his spinning wheel, all stopped what they were doing, listened to the music, and burst out crying. Truly, the underworld had never been so shaken. And upon the performance's conclusion, Queen Persephone leaned over to her husband and said, <laughs> Oh, Hades! <laughs> You gotta do it! <sniffs> so, Hades granted Orpheus's wish, despite the mortal's impertinence. And perhaps a little bit because of it. Who would have thought? Well, it figures. Because there was a condition. Sure, Eurydice would be summoned for Orpheus. And then yes, he could take her out of Hades' realm. Heck, even once she was out, she would be resuscitated and made mortal again. Given a true second chance at life, at him, and at love. 
But that would only happen if Orpheus could lead her out of the underworld without ever once looking back at his wife until they had come through the dark of hell and stepped into the light of the sun. Why, you ask? Well, you know, it had to be at least a little bit difficult or everyone would do it. Plus, Hades wasn't exactly the kindest or most romantic guy. I mean, he'd abducted his wife Persephone from her mother and kept his own father locked up in a basement, so you kind of get where this dude's whole vibe was. But to Orpheus, this sounded like the easiest part of the trip. He'd already charmed the Lord of the Dead and his dog, so don't look back. <laughs> no problem. So the shade of Eurydice was brought to the palace, though Orpheus was not allowed to see her. And then they left together, him leading her upward through the treacherous, subterranean, and pitch-black paths of Hades' somber realm. Neither dared speak. Orpheus never looked back. Only the soft, rhythmic plucking of his lyre gave comfort in the darkness. <sighs> he knew if he was careful and patient, all would be well. And then, finally, he made it. He came to the end of the underworld, left through its cavernous mouth, and once again felt the sun's warm embrace on his skin. Ah, uh, we did it, he said, and looked back excitedly. Though the more technical way of describing this moment would be to say that he did it, as in Eurydice was still a few steps away from the sun. And in that moment, when Orpheus saw his wife for the first time since her death, he beheld her frightened shade being clawed back down to the deepest and darkest places of death's kingdom, doomed to eternal oblivion, lost to love and life forever. As you can imagine, Orpheus beat himself up over this pretty bad, because truly, if he'd just waited a few more seconds, it would have made all the difference. Or would it have? See, there's a theory that Hades had contrived for that whole thing to happen. And even though it might not have felt like it to Orpheus at the time, when he was faced with tragedy, he tried taking the easy way out. Neither dying himself to join Eurydice, nor accepting that even he and his loved ones were subject to death's laws. No. Instead, Orpheus defied death to the Lord of the Dead's face. Hades was never going to let him get away with that. Heck, even if he'd waited longer at the exit, right? He may have just looked back and seen that Eurydice had never been there in the first place. And I think that's what we can take away from this. The rules of the natural and supernatural world can be bent from time to time. But it's important to remember that no matter what Orpheus or any of us do, quests to deny death are doomed from the start. And if that's not ironic, I don't know what I think. And while the irony of that situation is questionable at best, here's something that isn't questionable. You can now watch all of our animated episodes ad-free at least 24 hours early before they air on YouTube via our creator-owned and operated streaming service, Nebula. But how is this dark magic possible, you ask? Well, with the help of a bunch of our creator friends, we're now in full swing supporting a feature called Nebula First, where thanks to the support from Nebula, we can produce and release all of our extra history series episodes on Nebula at least a full week before they're posted to YouTube. Which means rather than listen to me Yammeron. Right now, you could be watching the final episode of our Napoleon in Egypt series. That Corsican runt! General Kleber shouts. That bugger has deserted us with his breeches full of shit. He clutches a long letter from Bonaparte, informing him that he's now in charge of the French forces in Egypt and offers detailed instructions for running the occupation. Napoleon, he's just learned, has returned to France. Egypt had served its purpose for him for he'd rewritten the history of the expedition to suit his ever-increasing cult of personality. Not to mention you'll get access to a ton of other great Nebula First content from creators like Joe Scott, Not Just Bikes, Bobby Broccoli, and more, all posting their videos earlier than you can see them anywhere else. Actually, speaking of things you can't see anywhere else, Nebula's home to a ton of other pretty fantastic original content as well. I've made some myself, Jeff and I have both created different Nebula classes in areas of our expertise, and more original stuff is being released all the time. Let's say you're looking for a hilarious feature-length film. Well, Patrick Willem's movie Night of the Coconut has got you covered. Or maybe you're more in the mood for an epic, transformative of modern Shakespearean remix. In that case, Abigail Thorne's The Prince delivers that in spades. How about a nail-biting race around the world game show with the Wendover crew? Then I foresee a ton of jet lag in your streaming future. Now, Nebula is normally priced at a pretty dang reasonable 50 bucks a year, but if you do sign up using our code in the link below, you'll be helping us out, of course, but also you'll get Nebula for only $2.50 a month when you sign up for an annual plan, breaking down to around 40% off the regular price. And I know the math is right because I did it in my own brain lab. Look, I could keep going on and on about the amazing content on Nebula or the deal or whatever, but it really is something that you should experience for yourself. I know I've said it before, but it has transformed the way I watch most of my stuff on the internet these days. And of course, by using our link to sign up, it really does help support myself and the rest of the EC crew make the content you love, while also helping us not be entirely dependent on YouTube. And I know I've said it before, but thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. Anyway, I hope to see you on Nebula real soon because I really do think you're going to enjoy it. 
Say, did you ever hear the one about Skylar Holmes, Kuya Koi, Joseph Blame, Dominic Valenciana, Casey Mustia, Arcolite Games, Angela Valenciana, and Ahmad Ziad Turk being fantastic legendary patrons? Because I sure did. <laughs>